Hello, we are back. And if you didn't notice, that was a live jingle done by Matthias here, who also made our long one. Um, Hello, everyone. Yeah. Hi. So, um, and you know, I just realized that Whisper is probably going to get desynced with the speech transcription after that happened, but it's okay. Um, yeah, so we're back from the break. Hopefully everyone had a good lunch. I'm still eating mine here, but what do we have now? So it's the Jupiter lesson and with us is Matthias and Redovan. So I guess I will head out and let them introduce it. So bye for Hello now. Hello everyone. Yeah, my name is Matthias. I work at CSC Finland and uh, happy to uh, go through the Jupiter lesson with you today. And hi from Norway, Radovan Bast here, University of Tromsø. I'm so much looking forward to yeah, discuss Jupiter Notebooks together with Matthias. Thanks also for the wonderful music. And our plan will be, we have one and a half hours. We will take a break. In circa 50 minutes, we will take a 10 minute break. And the best way to participate will be to watch what we do. We will demonstrate a few things but we will follow the material. So if you want to try that later on your, on your own, you can. And the best way to make this really interactive is to interact through the notes document. So please ask, comment, give suggestions. I'm here, Matthias Sidekick, and I will try, I will watch the document, ask questions and keep, try to keep a conversation going. Yeah. We're looking forward. Okay. Um, so start from the lesson material. Uh, I have the screen share. Uh, is it visible in the stream? Great. So what is Jupyter Notebooks um, or Jupyter Lab? This episode uh, <coughs> mentions, sorry, <coughs> the episode mentions Jupyter Notebooks uh, many times, but I think we actually demonstrate Jupyter Lab. They are both, they are tools for writing, especially code, but other stuff as well. So we are now talking about a tool, which we really like. And uh, uh, whether are you are using it for coding, uh, Python coding R, or just writing uh, documentation, uh, other texts, it doesn't matter. This is basically a tool to write some nicely structured texts and, and code. Uh, the purpose of this lesson is to get it, an idea what to use Jupyter for. And uh, we want to show some uh, examples. And uh, let's get it started. Uh, Radovan, do you use Jupyter in a daily basis or how yeah not maybe not daily basis but maybe weekly weekly basis and i use it often to i use it personally if for data analysis yeah or data visualization so if i want to visualize something plot something or do some statistics on data that's when i use it or when i want to try out a little prototype at some point, if the if the code gets bigger and more complex, often I move outside of a notebook and I do something else. But it's often a starting point for code coding. Yeah, I think so too. So when when starting to develop, uh, you want to test ideas and and uh, like figure out different ways to do something. Then I really like Jupyter as a tool. And what we now see here uh, is a screenshot. So there are two examples. Uh, one on the left with uh, just code in one block. Basically, this can be a script file. Uh, and then there's the output showing. And in the right side, there is a uh, same code, same functionality, but in smaller blocks. And this is what Jupyter uh, can do. So you have one line of code uh, and the output of that 
line of code and then you continue. Um, so it's a way to really structureize the, the code and and uh, also what I like is that you can uh, in the middle of your code you can see for example output of one uh, variable like in this case um, let me actually zoom in a little bit so there's this uh, variable da data frame that is uh, is being used in this code and in the middle of this whole uh, script uh, I check what's the value of that data frame and then I continue with the code so that kind of uh, functionality makes it easier to develop in uh, Jupyter Notebook. So is it so that you sometimes like to run a, a portion of a code at a time just to test it? And yes. I think for, for this it might be good. Also, if you want to have something like a lab book, like a logbook of code, ideas, images, documentation, everything in this in like one story, it can be a nice solution. Yeah. So yeah, can you can you put images in Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook? Yes. Right. We have, um, a, I think, example later where we will do yeah. that. Images, equations, text, tables. What else? Uh, code. Yeah, obviously. Yeah. Right. And if you are already using Visual Studio Code, for example, uh, and you don't want to learn a new tool, uh, I think you should still follow this lecture through because you can actually run uh, Jupyter Notebooks in Visual Studio Code, like shown, shown in here, and uh, Google Colab and GitHub Code Space is also mentioned. Uh, and we have an example, we can do an example of that as well. Here, scrolling down the lesson material, there's a couple case examples that you can go and see. Um, and these are particular examples of how Jupyter can help researchers to create code that is reusable to other people in like one glance. So there's the code and there's uh, explanations uh, over oh, like around the code so that a, a person who has never seen your code before can open it and read through the explanations and then run the code and see the results. And do we have time to check some of these? I think we have time. Cool. So I click the one of this uh, quick look at short segments of data, quick view. It opens this uh, GitHub page and here there are two options offered. You can use this binder, which we will do um, as a better example also later, but then there's also this collab and both of these work. I assume that collab maybe opens a little bit more quickly. So I, yeah, really nice. So now I can see, I can see that same notebook that those researchers did and created. And let's see if I can also run these cells. Oh, it needs a Google sign in. That's the downside of this uh, Google products. Uh, but yes, in, uh, in principle, it's possible to run the, this uh, whole notebook here. Uh, so you can test around, maybe tweak something if you want to understand how this works. And you can see the plots, uh, for example, here in, uh, in the same file where the code is. Really nice. Yeah, that's really reproducibility right here. It's, uh, yeah. This can be a nice, really nice way of sharing supporting information that should go along with the manuscript. So the manuscript has the has the summary, but then if I want to verify it or want to understand it or I want to reuse it, I have all the steps here available. Really a wonderful solution to share. So instead of just putting graphics 
um, I mean, images and tables into the manuscript. It can be a nice way to, to put images and tables into a manuscript, but then put all the steps into a notebook. And here we show you a Jupyter notebook, but maybe if you are developing R, maybe you're using R Markdown, uh, and that's a similar idea. So here's more about the idea than again, than really, uh, it's more about the why than the how. Yeah, so basically in, in R Studio, can you do the similar thing in, in R Markdown? I have never used it, but I think it's possible. Yes, yes, sorry, I was yeah. just, uh, I will answer yeah. one question in the in the notes, but it's yeah. the same idea that you can interleave code and mark down yeah. text in, in the same uh, same document. And please, uh, all the uh, comments and questions as usual in, in the collaborative document, uh, especially Radovan is now uh, checking out them and, and uh, can raise something out loud if, if we find something that we particularly want to share in, in the stream also. Uh, scrolling onwards to the lesson material, there's uh, use cases and pitfalls. So as with any tool, uh, it, Jupyter is good for something, but and then not so good for uh, some occasions. And here we try to have some like a um, overall view of the good stuff and uh, and then the not not so <laughs> good stuff so the basic use case is this kind of linear workflow and what i how i understand the linear workflow is that it starts from a point and and goes forward from there not doing any branches and so on so um, do, do you agree radovan Exactly. It's really an excellent fit for when you have this step-by-step -step workflow and at the end comes a figure, an image. Yeah, or... you mentioned data analysis. Mm -hmm. So you start from reading a data in and then uh, some uh, data manipulations, cleaning up and then doing the plots and there you go. For that kind of thing, Jupyter is really good. and. As mentioned also, if you want to experiment and test, uh, it's really easy to experiment because you can have the different versions there uh, next to each other and, and run them as you like. And there's uh, many, the, yeah. Uh, the, so the service that Matthias shown, and we will later demonstrate, it allows people to run the code without like installing anything they can run it in a browser so we will come back to that yeah and maybe if we have time if you if it's easy for you to open up the notes we are getting a couple of really good questions yeah and i want to encourage more so at the bottom there are two that we can briefly discuss now one is how does it work with privacy and sensitive data and what we what we will later show is that it can be a good idea to put your notebook onto github and make it runnable for everybody and make that part of your paper. But how, now how about privacy and sensitive data? So what uh, what can you do there? I mean, you don't want to put the, the actual sensitive data then on, on GitHub and make it publicly visible. Yeah, never a good idea to put sensitive data in GitHub. But like, I, I would like to start from the fact that Jupyter runs, if, if you want to do locally, you can run Jupyter locally on your computer. So you don't have to share anything anywhere if, if you don't want to. And uh, then um, considering GitHub and, and sharing and, and reusability, you can share your code, but not the data. And I think that's the case regardless of the tool that you are using to write the code. But it's still nice to share some data so that people can actually run it. But then you don't have to share the actual sensitive data. You can show you can share an example data set yeah. with John Doe, Jane Doe, example person. And so that people can still verify this is working. They can still replace it by the actual data. But then the the sensitive data can be then protected on a on a dedicated server. So that can be a good solution. 
A uh, similar solution is if your data is big, gigantic, but if you have terabytes of data and it's difficult for you to share it, it can still be nice to share a small example data set so then people can still run your notebook, but then replace it by the real gigantic data. How about Git and Git and notebooks? I just want to say that we will come back to that. Yeah. In before in the next half an hour, we will show you what are some of the challenges when working with Git. Because yeah. we still want to work with Git, we still didn't forget what we taught last week. We want to use Git, uh, but there are some challenges. But we will show you that there are really nice solutions to to use all the tools from last week to, in combination with notebooks. So we will get there, and keep the questions coming. This is wonderful. Yeah, and uh, there's a upcoming question about the privacy in in Google Colab. So I think in there it, it's the question of Google's privacy and should refer to the the uh, privacy statement of the Google Colab service. Yes, and if I would run then the notebook with with sensitive data, I would run it on the infrastructure made for it, and maybe that's my own computer. Yeah, and you can run also uh, uh, Jupyter Lab in in many HPC clusters. So then the data can be in, in your cluster, but you can still use Jupyter if that's what you like for your workflow. Some of the pitfalls in, in Jupyter, uh, especially when there's this non-linear code flow, would you like to elaborate on that a little bit, Radama? So if it starts to, if you have, if you write a program that has lots of modules, and it's not, first we do this, then we do this, then we do that, then we do the other thing. But sometimes you have a code that uh, maybe we go in here into this module, or maybe, maybe not, maybe into the other module, uh, then it it doesn't really fit into a notebook. A notebook is really like a recipe of do these series of steps. If it doesn't fit into a series of steps, then maybe a notebook is not the right thing. But you can use modules also in Jupyter. You can. So the and we will get back to that tomorrow. We will actually yeah. show how to do it. So you yeah. can, if you have reusable code blocks and you realize that while well, I'm using the same code block in all of my notebooks and I'm tired of copy pasting it, uh, you can put these into a module and you can include modules in the notebook. But it should be this series of steps. If it's a series of steps, then yes. Yeah. And. Uh mention some good practices. Uh, Jupyter, the basic Jupyter uh, usually renames the, uh, or uses the default naming of untitled. So when you start a new notebook, it's a good idea to uh, always have your own name so that you later know what what's the notebook is about. And uh, also mm -hmm. run all cells before saving. I think that's something that we can show in, in the example yeah let's show later. yeah let's demonstrate the good practices yes um so the notebook interface and and how to actually start the whole um whole tributor lab so i will go in um, into a terminal here and uh, get it started let's see where i am oh i'm in uh, and typically, so we, everybody else than Matthias, we should watch and ask, but uh, I just wanted to comment here that typically we want to start the notebook, you are often inside some environment. So now we are in a, inside a software environment and often you have a specific environment for each of your projects. This is something that we have recommended yesterday. And in there, we will now start up a notebook and the notebook will then open up Oh, we start it, but then we we interact with it through the browser. Yes. So as mentioned in the material, I create a new uh, folder and I go there. And then it says I have to uh, launch the Jupyter Lab. But first, I need the code refinery conda environment, right? Yes. So here you activate your programming environment that we have set up with all the dependencies that we need for this uh, 
example, if people later want to try it on their own, they you can you can create an environment that this looks exactly like ours, and in this you can run this um, run the Jupyter Lab. Is it Jupyter yeah. Lab with minus in, or is it Jupyter Space Lab? Uh, both work actually, with or without the minus. Yeah, mm -hmm. and uh, I wanted to mention that you actually can if you don't want to. Uh, mess up with code refinery and conda environment stuff uh, you might be unsure how the conda works or something uh, I we encourage you to try and ask for help if, if needed but if you don't want to there is also a version of Jupyter lab uh, as a desktop app I'm not sure which platforms it supports but that exists at least so here now I'm uh, launching the Jupyter Lab in the terminal. I'm using this no browser option and because I want to decide where in which browser I open it. There's a lot of text coming up, but we don't want we don't need to uh, care about that. Only thing we do is we copy paste this uh, URL in the end. Mm -hmm. So if you would if you would have yeah. left out this no browser, it would open up your default browser somewhere. But yes. if you want to have more control of which browser it is, I also do the same thing as you. I I take it into my browser, then then I decide where this is opened. So I copy paste this to a browser into URL field, and it opens. So now that uh, actually let's go to see how this uh, Jupyter is uh, like a structured. So in the in the core there's this kernel and notebook server and they are now running in the terminal here. And then the browser is what shows you the user interface and then you can happily use it. So now we have the user interface in the browser and uh, there's now we should go to see that what's the what's around the Jupyter interface right so in the material there's this uh, screenshot that you can mm -hmm. refer to whenever you want to um, is if you forget for something you to, yeah is it easy for you to zoom in a little bit yes I think so yeah great thanks yeah so we have this uh, toolbar containing some tabs uh, then there's some buttons some menus and the file view in in the right side so the toolbar contains the the file explorer and open kernels and the git integration and this works if you have used the code refinery conda environment because this is an extension and it's there installed that's why we uh, recommend trying the code refinery conda environment uh, and other extensions in in here but we focus on the file browser and uh, later on in the in the git uh, extension so now what we do we create a new Jupyter notebook and the launcher in here is the place to go the first option is notebook there are other options you can open a terminal or text file or markdown file here if you want to but <clears throat> as we are in, in Jupyter let's go with the notebook option I'm gonna zoom out just a little bit and as I mentioned it creates a new file and it's untitled so what I do at first is uh, rename the file <laughs> right is there uh, questions or something should I just go on all is good yep great so now in the Jupyter notebook file there are different types of cells I can create more cells and I can delete cells I can reorganize cells do and you this do that is with some keyboards or how it looks very fast yes uh, and I can say that the way I do it often is that I click on these symbols so the, also if you 
if you move the mouse over the over the cell, there is a symbol like I want one more cell above or below. Yes. Uh, just quickly mention that I'm gonna explain from the material. I'm gonna explain these uh, cells, but afterwards there is the list of keyboard shortcuts. And as with any tool, if you want to uh, use a tool quickly and effectively, I really recommend to learn the shortcuts. It applies to any any tool, basically. Um, everything is, of course, uh, like Radova mentioned, it, it's it's all here. You can... Uh, yeah, I meant add, the symbols so in the cell, like if you... Yeah. This, you know, the, the third cell from the top, and then the symbols to the right there, I use those. Yeah. So you can reorder, you can add cells below, above, and delete cells. Yeah, I, I use the keyboard shortcuts. There's a A for, actually it shows the keyboard shortcuts in here, so you can uh, hover your mouse and uh, start to learn. The, nice, the, I didn't know, okay. Yeah, cool. that's, that's a handy one. Uh, so there are different, now these are all code cells. I'm gonna remove all but two and uh, what would be the first cell if you uh, start a new notebook would you start with the code cell in reality yes but later i would like to have a title there but maybe i will come up with the title later but let's start with the title yeah so here's a small menu that you, you can open and see all the different uh, types of cells that you um, you can have Usually I use Markdown and of course code for code, but then there are certain cases you might want to use raw. That means it shows you the raw text, um, mm -hmm. nothing fancy there, but we want the fancy thing. So <laughs> let's go with Markdown. And the point there is that it renders nicely. So it looks fancier than uh, just a plain text. Uh, how did I get it to render? I use this run command. So, and, and tells you that shift enter is the, the um, shortcut there. So this is now the start of my cool um, project, coding project. And uh, then I can start the coding stuff. What should I import then? Sounds good. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> right. So there are markdown cells and there's code cells. What do you, what else you can put in the markdown cells than just uh, text? I'm wondering whether we should um, whether we should follow the example that we have there, just that people can recreate it step by step. Yeah. Or I just found the, and copied the mm -hmm. markdown cell from that lesson material, and now if I run this one, we can see different options. So there's uh, headings, there's links, there's different formatting for the text, and even equations and images. So this is really nice. And the equations work uh, as a, uh, everything that's uh, in between these uh, dollar signs is an equation and the syntax is the LaTeX syntax. Okay. So some of the shortcuts uh, and navigation if you double click the, the cell, you uh, go to the edit mode, or you can go with enter and esc keys to the edit mode and back. Uh, you can, with arrow keys, like from here, from the edit mode, I, I run or click esc, esc, and then I can, with arrow keys, uh, navigate the cells back and forth. And uh, 
let's not forget to save. Okay. I think we go forward. Is there any questions? All is good. So just to summarize, we you you have often two two ways to create cells. It can be code, for for example, Python, and it can be a Markdown cell. And Markdown we have discussed earlier today. Markdown is what we see in the in the notes document. And then you can do more. You can do equations and images. Yeah. And then we will build up notebooks by putting code and documentation and try to tell a story. So what's the example that we will show next? Yes. Um, we go next. And there's the first computational notebook example. And you mentioned the magic word story. So one of the benefits is, is there that you can have this narrative around the code and uh, <clears throat> that makes it easier to understand for people that are new to your code. So in this example, we are creating this code that calculates pi, the value of pi, uh, in with this statistical method. And scrolling onward, we first launch the Jupyter Lab. That's what we have here already. I'm going to uh, hide those first cells that I can get a clean slate. We can also and start a new notebook even inside. That's it? yeah, that's even better. So here is a, um, this plus button and we get the launcher back and new notebook and again it's untitled let's rename it and here again we are this is demo only matthias will type and we will check that there are no typos yes and everybody please ask questions uh, so if you don't remember anymore how I did uh, open the Jupyter in a browser that I wanted. Here's the, the command in this in this demo. And I think now your goal will be to scroll down to the first point and we will build up an example notebook by following these points oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. And if people later want to try it out on their own, you can you find everything here. Yeah. So First, mm -hmm. I copy paste. It says that add it to a markdown cell. So I copy this line here, go to the, my Jupyter lab, and I'm using the shortcut M to create this, uh, to change this cell to be a markdown cell. Of course, I can use the, the uh, option menu here as well. I click into the cell and Command V, I'm using Mac. so command V or control V to paste. Then we go to see what else is there. So all the cells uh, that are needed to create this demo, they are included in here. So what you basically can do is to copy paste uh, the cells. Just be careful that you use the appropriate cell uh, types. So what happens if I use a code cell for this it uh, at first it looks not so great and if I try to run it it does not run because that's not a code syntax so that's why yeah uh, it's not Python it will try to yeah it will try to interpret this with Python and Python is then confused yes and then it's again markdown cell Oh, there's a cool picture. So this is now a conceptual uh, explanation on the method that we're going to use on this pi calculation. Again, no, this I took this one as uh, so fourth one. Now this is the first code cell, which is there. So it imports the modules that we need. That's why we don't we don't see an output for this code cell because 
there's no output it just imports the libraries that we want to um, I will continue copy pasting the cells and the point here is not to understand this code or the Python syntax uh, but to figure out why this uh, Jupyter notebook is then a nice way of structuring the code or nice tool to to use for this kind of um, code exercise so now these are the all the cells if I didn't miss any in between and we got these plots and they are visualized in here like right after the code cell and then there's also the final result here outputted so oh well it's quite close to the actual pi value yeah and the the big picture here like don't worry if all the steps are not clear this is it's a certain approximate way to compute the number pi here the, the big picture what is really important for all of us is that we we have documentation and code and images in a notebook and the computation it's a series of computations so yes. something that we will try later is what if we run them in the wrong order and what what does it mean for us what does it mean for our like good practices of how we should use notebooks yes and and uh, an example of this uh, documentation in between I, I, I could add here uh, for example a subtitle that start plotting or oh, start and more explanations of course if I have any so going onward from the lesson material it mentions that there's possibility to use other languages uh, so there's a R Markdown for R and Pluto for Julia. So the workflow there is similar to the Jupyter Lab. So we hope that if even if you uh, want to use R, you still get the idea of this workflow from this lesson. Did we show how to run things in the wrong order? I was I was just a little bit distracted here answering questions. Right. So what I, I can do it now. So what I do is, uh, let's say I want, want to start over the whole uh, calculation. Now the, the values of the, all the variables and everything, the code has run, uh, the variables are there. Uh, so what I do first, I want to demonstrate what if I want to start over. I go here and restart the kernel and it says that all variables will be lost which is okay because I want to start over and now I, I will go and run the cells one by one with this shift enter but let's say let's say I forget this one I grab a cu cup of coffee and I, I forget this cell and I continue running from here now I get some error message and what should I get from this error message? Yeah, now the notebook doesn't know the variable points it has never been defined. It doesn't know what the value is because we never ran the cell. So two cells up or three cells up. Or we saw the cell number four. All right. Was never yes. defined. Actually now just a <laughs> new question. Is there a search function in here? What if I don't find this name points in anywhere? Can I do some searching? I, I normally, so maybe there's a clever way. What I do is I, I use the browser search. Yeah, okay. For, the, for these kind of situations. Actually, now that I press Command F, yeah. it actually opens the search inside here. So maybe there is, let's see, points. Okay, yeah. now I can see that 
this matches to the one in error message so I run this one now I run the erroneous cell again now it works so if I'm if I run the cells so often when we develop you try things out and then you improve and you develop you often you when developing you don't run everything every single time you run the cell until it works then you go somewhere else you try something else but what can then happen is that we can get into a situation where you think everything is working but then you give it to the next person or you come to it in a week and suddenly it doesn't work anymore because the, what what the next person will do the first thing that the next person will do is they will run everything from top to bottom and so the, the good practice and the good recommendation is to run everything from top to bottom before you save it and before you share it with other people to make sure that this is working because this is the first thing they will do yeah and in addition i i would also restart kernel and run all cells because then mm -hmm. you might have saved some variable values somewhere in in different sections and it remembers the last saved value uh, so if you restart you kind of make sure that your code works from top to the bottom. Yeah. Should we talk about Git, a version control and notebooks? Definitely. Before we go into the break. Yeah. Going to the next part in the lesson, notebooks and version control. And this is uh, still a demo demonstration. And let, let me know if there's any questions in in all yep. such questions that you should uh, address here. Mm -hmm. So there are tools to do version control on, on this uh, Jupyter files. Underlying format there uh, with the Jupyter files is this JSON. So if you only uh, use the basic git uh, diff tool, it may look much more complex than your original code and then your face goes like so there are tools to make that easier and which one of these we have in this uh, conda environment here jupyterlab git and mbdime checking yeah so the mbdime we definitely have we have I think you have some of the Git extensions. I'm just verifying here. Yeah, we have we have JupyterLab Git. We have MBDime in there. I think the GitHub web interface nowadays can also render the Jupyter. Yeah, and maybe this is something we can show. But this is something yeah. you need to enable. So there are these three steps there. Okay, so let's first go in in uh, JupyterLab interface so uh yeah this is what it would look like without those tools um this is a difference of an image that has been edited uh it's pretty horrible unless you like the the <laughs> underlying format of a png picture but going forward and using these rich rich diff tools uh, we can actually see how the picture was previously and how it's in the new edited version so let's see if we can do it in here what i need to do first is to uh, initialize the repository so we are in in the folder that we i have this jupyter notebook files and I can create a Git repository out of that folder uh, without leaving this Jupyter notebook, uh, which is kind of cool. So I click initialize a repository. So now this folder is a Git repository. It shows that there's uh, uh, untracked files. So why there's four files untracked although i have only two files in here and what should i do with this uh let's see 
these look like the original uh, two notebooks that I created and these are some checkpoint files. So what should I do with the checkpoint files? So the checkpoints, I think they are directories, maybe checkpoint files, but uh, uh, these are often things that I ignore. I git ignore. I add them to my git ignore because they are, I see them as temporary local files that I don't want to have in my git repository. Okay, so I uh, right click and ignore that file and it tells me that git ignore does not exist but actually it just creates one and then I can track uh, all the files and make my first commit. And now this is only going to the local folder so I'm, I have I run the Jupyter Lab in a local folder. Uh, I created the Git repository that's again in the local folder. Uh, later on, I can upload the folder in in GitHub if I want to. Mm -hmm. But now there's the first initial commit done. So there's the snapshot of these notebooks as they are now. And now let's change something. Okay. Yeah, let's then verify what we will see. For instance, you can change the the size of the figure. So somewhere there is this fig set size inches. You yes. could maybe make it larger, smaller. I'm or, scrolling to the uh, lowest yeah. cell with the yeah. Or change the colors or something like that. Yeah, I would love to change the colors, but I don't remember how it's done. Let's start with the size. Yeah, let's go with the size. Now it's smaller, this one. So basically, um, it still renders the output as a uh, regular size, but I think these went bigger, so that it's actually the actual image is sm smaller. So now if I would uh, print out or save it to a file, it, it would be a smaller, smaller in size. Now I save. And let's see. Now so the Git extension the shows. Yeah, there's some changes. So before I uh, commit the uh, changes, I want to show what has been edited. So I click this small icon that uh, says diff. And now this is how this Git. Uh, Jupyter Git tool shows the difference. So here's the code that I changed, the lines and the output. So this is the old one and here's the new one. Mm -hmm. So everything with red is the old one, everything is with green is the new one. And that's that's good. And this works because we use this NB dime extension, which is notebook diff and merge and which helps us to really easily see what was before, what was after. If we used, if we tried this with a notebook or with a Jupyter lab without this extension, uh, we might see a difference in the underlying source code. Can we? So long story short, we recommend to use this extension and also on GitHub, we recommend to enable that extension so that you can see nice differences. What is your yeah. question? Yes. Uh, yeah, I mean, I just click the show source button and this is the horror lying in, in inside. Yeah, yeah, I really prefer the, the nice render here. Yeah, great. Thanks. And if you want to try it out on GitHub, we have then on our lesson, we have, we have some steps on what you need to do. So it's a, you need to go on preview features, enable this rich Jupyter preview, I forgot the name. So I now wait, what? I'm on GitHub and then some settings. So on yours, uh, yes, on your picture there, and then you go yeah. on feature preview. Nice. Yes. And then on the left side, there is rich Jupyter notebook diffs. I think you have it enabled. Yes, I have it enabled. So this is basically the same similar looking feature exists in GitHub, which is really nice. And then if you go back to the lesson, we have an example. So if you click on, scroll a little bit up. Up? Yes. 
there is this sentence that a little bit down. So, so on the bottom of your screen, you can click on that link. It's actually a diff. It's a comparison between two versions. And you can all try to open it up. If you don't have that enable uh, extension enabled, it will look not very understandable. But uh, with that extension enabled, we can see what was before, what came after. OK, great. I guess now we are up to a break, right? Yes, we got a couple of interesting questions, but I I will take the questions. Let's take them after the break. So after the break, what we should discuss, like what are the advantages of notebook versus script, uh, script versus VS Code, VS Code versus notebook. So that's for after the break. I will add here info, so we'll... info box. So when should we be back? Is it sharp? Until let's do let's be precise here zero zero one. Okay, Thanks. great. Thank you. And then we will do more more Jupiter. See you soon. See you. Welcome back from the break. We continue with the Jupiter uh, notebooks and uh, big topic for the less uh, for the last half hour or so is the sharing notebooks but how about if you share the notebook to someone who does not use Jupyter lab but instead to uh, wants to use um, visual studio code and for that i wanted to show you how it looks like so this is the same folder that we used in the previous examples and there we we created the uh, Jupyter notebooks in the Jupyter lab, and now the same folder opened in uh, in Visual Studio Code. I can see that here's the same, actually the same notebook that I created as an example. There's the same plots and everything showing up. Oh, this is smaller because we created it smaller. So. They open up just nicely. Did you have to install anything up other than VS Code? Um, I'm going to check my extensions. So yes, there is a Jupyter uh, extension installed in, but it's uh, you can find it in the Visual Studio Code and extensions and search for Jupyter. Yeah. And you personally, if you like write a notebook, do you write it in VS Code or do you write it in a browser? Mm, I really like the Jupyter Lab mm -hmm. interface and, and, and the looks. Uh, I don't know why, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I prefer this one. Mm -hmm. How about you? Yeah, me too. I. I use the browser for notebooks. Yeah. I use Visual Studio Code for a bunch of other stuff, but yeah, both work, which is nice. So then to the sharing of the notebooks, there's uh, many different ways to share and actually too many. <laughs> which one of these you have actually used? I mean, they are obviously both are all useful, but which one mm -hmm. uh, you have used? So one one thing that I'm not even sure we listed is one step is to put it on places like GitHub. Yeah. So that's one way one way to share it. Then somebody else can view it there. It's static because it will it actually you can only see the the image of it. You cannot go in and change it. But we will also show you a way where you can share it in a way that people can really run it and change it. So which one I have used GitHub, I have used uh, Binder. I have also experimented a little bit with Jupyter Lite. I have not tried the other ones. Yeah. I think further further down we have also some alternatives that are there are some companies behind it. So I have yes. I have tried uh, the, the CoCalc. Sorry, no the is that the one? No, I'm, what I meant is the Google Colab. 
Yeah. I have tried, yeah, some of those. Yeah. And well, if static is uh, enough for you, then in Jupyter Lab, there's this uh, file menu and there's this export options. But some of these might need some extra installation. So just so that you know. But this is, of course, the probably the easiest way to just share the file. Mm -hmm. um, but let's go with the um, use case where the people that you want to share the file with want to also experiment on, on your notebook. So this is a demo yeah. about that. And the use case is you want, you want people to be able to run it without even installing any any software environment or Jupyter or JupyterLab or anything, all they will need is a browser. Okay, so it says that I should create a new GitHub repository. So let's do that. I'm going to GitHub and uh, this is um, Jupyter Binder demo and and I will, what I will do is I will then, once you create it, I will share the link with everybody else so that people can f can see what we did there. So do you want to link to this uh, repository? Yes, but I will add it to the document. So it's public. Just a sec, I need to find yeah. it. It is this one. So the next step for me is to add a new file. It took me some time to find this button because now it's um, uh, zoomed in so much that it's in here, but it's behind um, next to this code button, uh, create new file. No, I want to upload a new file, right? Yep. Because upload I the notebook. Yes, I have the notebook that I just created in the previous example and commit message yes we all always have to write something here it's a difficult to come up with useful ones though don't worry we are totally not judging <laughs> the commit message <laughs> yeah and committing directly to the main branch because i know that there's can't be no one else uh, doing any editing yet because this is so new thing so new repository I mean okay now it's there with the readme nice what would be the next step oh uh, next step I need to also navigate to the right place Let's there's this what... requirements txt right ah yeah that's a nice connection to yesterday this is a file so we need to de describe the software environment that we need. It can be either a requirements.txt file. It can also be an environment.yaml file. Both were mentioned yesterday in the reproducibility lesson. And here we can list what are the libraries that we need. And in this case, we will need the matplotlib, which is which is a Python library used for plotting. And so we, if, how, how, how do I know that which uh, libraries, which things I need to list in the requirements txt? Well, that's a good question. If sometimes it's a bit trial and error, so it depends a bit how you installed the dependencies that you use in the notebook. I like to personally, when I install dependencies, I put them into a file like requirements.txt and then I install from the file because then I don't have to remember it, I can look into the file. But if you don't have the file, and maybe you installed this half a year ago and you don't remember it anymore, then I go into my notebook and I see, I look at all the imports. And now... Of, yeah, this uh, is at least the starting point here. Yeah, and with, uh, with some Python knowledge, you would know that random is actually not, it's a standard library, it's part of Python. And Patplotlib is an external library, but but this is now about this is Python knowledge. 
Right, so we don't need to take this random now, but we have to take, sorry, I'm navigating back to the uh, GitHub. We have to mention matplotlib and the yeah. version. If we don't, if we leave out the version, we will get the latest one. Okay. Which will still work today. But the question is, will the notebook then still run in five years? So depending on what your use case is, you might want to put the version there or not. If we forget to put something into the requirements of text, we will notice it because this is now, this will run as an isolated thing. And if there are dependencies missing, we will notice. So sometimes I do like I add something, I run it, aha, something missing. Okay, I add something more until it works. Yeah. So the next step shown in the lesson material is to go to mybinder.org. And this is just a web page, right? How does this help our cause? Here it will help that we once we have the repository, we there is this GitHub field. Yes. Where you can put a GitHub repository address. And if people want to try it out later, you you can notice that it doesn't have to be GitHub. The the notebook can be on other places. Let's see, it can be on GitLab or it can be on Zenodo or some other places where you can deposit a notebook and even get a digital object identifier for a notebook. So that would be even better than putting in putting it only on GitHub. But here we want to show how how to do it when your notebook is on GitHub. So you take the yeah. address. So can I just use the URL? The URL? Yeah. From right the here. URL field. Um, without the tree, without the main. Yeah, like this. So that will hopefully work. Uh, notice that on the left side it says head. It will take the. It will actually take the main. Oh, sorry, the main branch, the default branch. You could point it to a, another branch or a tag if you have that. Yeah. Do I need this uh, path to notebook file? I mean, it says optional, so I guess no. no. And so you don't even have to launch it. You can. Uh, what we can do is. There just is this, copy this one. Uh, what you can do is just below the line below there is the launch binder uh, batch and right of it is the little arrow. Click on that little arrow. And now there is a markdown version and an RSD version. What you can do is you can copy that markdown batch. Yeah. Because that will form a nice link to the documentation lesson. And let's put it into our readme. Okay, so I copy this one and go to my a repository and to the readme file and I want to edit it now and and maybe you can zoom in a little bit but let me see yeah so I copy pasted this um, uh, markdown tag in here so it's an address to a web server and this web server which is which will be running on mybinder.org it will be generated on the fly on the fly it will create hopefully let's see it will create a container for us it will install the dependencies into it the dependencies which we have described in requirements of text and in this container it will run the notebook hopefully yeah. So now Let's I have this party started. Yeah. And now it's cool, cool looking tag in, in my uh, readme and didn't cost anything. So I click the tag and now it took me here. So it's loading up and while it's loading up, it's showing me this, uh, static version of the files can i actually click here okay you can click on it but it only gives you a static preview because now yeah now it's installing the dependencies and why it's installing if we are impatient it will it at least wants to give us like the preview of how it will look yeah it's nice to see that at least like 
is this what I'm looking for? I mean, if I realize here that no, this is not the this is not the droids we are looking for. No, uh, the Jupiter lab that we are looking for. Then maybe I go away. But now I see that this is exactly what I want to see. So I shall be waiting for the actual binder uh, container to start. Yeah, and it's the first time we do that. It can take seconds, minutes. Once it is has been set up, it's faster to to run. And this is normally not not a problem because th this is really for the, now we imagine that we are the person reading the publication and now we want to reproduce the steps and I don't mind waiting waiting three minutes for this thing to start for me. Yeah. In the meantime, what we can do while this is spinning up, we can have a look at the questions and discuss some of them. Yes. Let's open up the notes. Uh, there are some more detailed questions, like one more bigger picture question was uh, what is the advantage of, like when should I use a notebook, when should I use VS Code, when should I use Python scripts? And it one answer that we gave is that it's also a bit of personal preference. It, we we show you different tools and you can choose the one that feels more comfortable for you and for the use case. There's a question. Uh, oh yeah, okay. Here's answers as well. There's some funny rendering here, just mm -hmm. to, the comparing Jupyter Lab and VS Code. I, I think VS Code can do the about the same things. There's also the Git inter integration right in there. So uh, I guess that's all in all easier to start in VS Code, add the, uh, I mean, the Git is there already, I think, and you can add the Jupyter extension. So maybe there's less overall installation thing, maybe less uh, hustling in the terminal if you want to avoid that for some reason, like me. Mm -hmm. So it's a question of what people prefer. It's also a question of who do you collaborate with? Yeah. Is there something else? So there question? are interesting questions at the bottom, but I need to look it up. So, so, so one question is that it is definitely possible that you have different environments in different directories. So you could imagine that if you just move out of a project and move into a different project, that it automatically switches environment. I need to look up the details. I know it's possible. There is something called dot env, dot env, but there's just one solution to this, which will change your environment if you go into a directory and it will change it to something else if you move out of it. But I need to look it up. Yeah. Then there is another question which connects more to what was discussed yesterday, like what is the best tool for managing dependencies? I think that's hard to answer because there are so many tools. Um, maybe the two most popular ones are Conda or virtual environment, but there are really many. And and again, it depends a bit on you, what you prefer, what your, what your collaborators prefer. Often these tools can, but the idea of isolating environments to have isolated environments per project. That's a good idea. And um, any of these tools allow it. And often you can convert one to the other. Yeah, like um, <clears throat> for me, for example, I, I think I've used Conda and, and Virtual Env, but uh, more, more in the way that if I have instructions, I know how to launch the the virtual environment, and then I can navigate myself around the code or run the, run the code. So, to to all those people who might be wondering that oh this is all too much, uh, start if if you have the collaboration case. So there's someone who created the environment. Start from uh, trying to run the code and launch the virtual environment and run the code. 
uh, that's already uh, enables you to to start the collaboration there so don't worry although it might feel overwhelming uh, discussing all those different um, all those different virtual environments and, and tools for that okay so in the context of binder it's often a requirements of text or environment.yaml how are we doing there is it still in is the it... process of so if you if you go to that link again from your readme does yeah it, does um, it then resolve i think i've lost my um did we not commit it because i can also oh we, you have committed it what people can do oh i can also start it on my side hmm. no i mean i i just lost my uh tabs yeah but on, lucky you put this in in the oh in yeah there here. it is so yeah. you can start it from there and i started it on my side people can try it too but let's not let's see whether this overwhelms binder so on my th on my computer it started up so it will also soon do it on yours here it is now we see the planets orbiting so the moons are orbiting Jupiter and there it is. So this is now not running on Matthias computer. It's on somewhere in the cloud, accessible through the browser. You can try to visit it too. And you can try to run the notebook that we just created. And you can even go in and change it. So what if I change it? Does it save and where? No, it, so if you change it and then leave it, at some point this, this container will vaporize so, so if i you can want, if basically you... I, I can mess up everything here in this yep. environment if i want to and so you can the original is there yeah if you wanted to change it and keep the changes you would have to save them so you can you can take the notebook and save it onto your computer so that will be the way to preserve them right. but here we can all experiment i mean go in and try to modify some numbers try to run it and we have a we have a dynamic notebook and if we now, we could go one step further and get a DOI for it, and which we will not do, but but then we are sure that this thing will be available in the next 10 years. And if we are careful about dependencies and about documenting dependencies with versions, we can be reasonably sure that this thing will still run in 10 years. Pretty cool. Right. So I made some edits. I wanted to see how close this um, statistic result was. So I compared that result to uh, the actual pi provided by NumPy library. And well, it's in, in two decimals. Quite OK. Yeah, this is very cool. Binder is a wonderful service. It is non-profit. There are different services that do similar things. Some of them are non-profit, some of them are for-profit. Here we wanted to show you a really nice service that is does a lot of good for community and is a non-profit one. Yeah. Um, there are some optional exercises uh, about tracking the dependencies, which we also discussed a little bit. Uh, what to put in the requirements on txt and how to find them and then there is um, uh, optional exercise about sharing an uh, interactive notebook so what does the interactive mean in this case this means um, and it will connect to somebody ask a question of how can you have interactive images i mean interactive graphics in a notebook and this is one way of doing that doing it yeah uh, so you can have a slider for instance that you can slide from left to right and then you can make it change values and then you can define it so that images automatically adapt to it there are many ways to implement this but here we show we show you one yeah so um, I, 
mm. I really encourage you to go uh, to see the, um, like, um, optional exercises that there there's a quite a lot of nice material also some new things for me also I guess one that I actually would like to advertise here now is this shell commands magic and widgets so there are some extra features in in, in Jupyter you can uh, you can ask it for help about uh, some object so if you don't know what this NP sum uh, does, you can add a question mark there, and and apparently it will tell you. Uh, scrolling a little bit down, you can run uh, shell or terminal commands in in Jupyter uh, by adding this exclamation mark. Uh, that can be really nice. For example, in a case that. Uh, you want to know in which which folder you are in now this is probably going to look curious because it's in the binder container but uh, anyhow and then oh there's some magic <laughs> i think i have never tried this and then the widgets that uh, we mentioned that you can add more interacti interactive elements in, in, in the Jupyter Lab. Yeah, do we go to the summary? Let's do that. And also reminder to everybody else, on the bottom of the notes, I have pasted requests for feedback. Please let us know how today went. There are also some questions that we can discuss in voice, but uh, I don't know if you wanted to share some summary slide or say a few words, Matthias. Uh, yeah, in, in the lesson material, there's this uh, nice summary, uh, more links and uh, blog posts and articles. And then also, again, mentioned these other tools for other languages than, than Python. and. Uh, like a reminder on, on the thing that we already also mentioned that when you start with the Jupyter Lab or Jupyter Notebook, you start experimenting and, and develop more and more. At some point you have a really long notebook, um, but then it starts to grow. So the one good practice was to every time before you save and share uh, restart kernel run all cells to see that your notebook actually runs in order and there's no errors and uh, then also try to organize it and and use the subtitles or, or headlines headings uh, to keep the the notebook in in order so that it's easy also for you after one year to to get back to it yeah you mentioned some questions is there still something that you would like to raise uh, so we can that was a comment that tomorrow we will connect to this we will when we discuss modular code development, we will actually tomorrow start in a notebook and we will then experience a moment when maybe it feels like, ugh, you know, uncomfortable and it feels like we want to move out of a notebook. So we will see that we will see a situation and the situation will be once we start adding tests that so we will start in a notebook and maybe move out into scripts. We will also tomorrow talk about automated testing. So two really exciting lessons coming up. We hope to see you all tomorrow again. And thanks a lot for giving feedback below. Tell us one thing that you liked about today. Tell us also one thing that we should change or remove. Yeah, I think we've been changing at least something in, in every time we have this workshop, right? Yes, because this the topics they they are evolving so we need to evolve with them 
and this is, this goes more about the content, but it also goes uh, uh, it's also about the forum and how we present it. Yeah. So thank you for this lesson. Thank you for following, and thank you for the feedback. Uh, keep it coming, and thank you, Radovan, for having me here. Yeah. Thanks, Matthias. Always a pleasure. Thanks also for the music. Sure. <laughs>